I think we're told from a really early age that health and beauty is about the way that we look and it's about the weight on the, you know, how much you weigh or, and it's just like stepping away from that, especially as women and understanding that our health does not equal our weight. That's Lindsay Lewis. And this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Cara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Lindsay Lewis is a doctor of Chinese medicine, an acupuncturist, an herbalist, and a yoga teacher who practices out of San Diego, California. Growing up in small town Alabama, she assumed the only way to help heal people was through traditional medicine. When she discovered holistic and to us Westerners alternative medicine, it was a complete game changer. On this episode, we talk about healthcare in America, the not discussed enough women's reproductive health, the continuing to be discovered by science benefits of acupuncture, plus how to be your fully expressed self. All that and so much more coming up, but first. Do you know the number one thing that you can do to keep this podcast going and to help us get more kudos out in the world and to have more people know about us? Go right now to your favorite place to listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, tune in. I mean, holy smokes, there's a million right now, but I need you to subscribe and I need you to rate us and I need you to leave a comment about how much you love it. Even if you just want to talk about how much you love me or hashtag engineer Jordan, that works too but it'll mean so much to us to share how you feel about it and to love us by subscribing, liking, and rating. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you for being on the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Let's start by telling everyone listening who you are and what you're up to. Yeah, my name uh, is Lindsay Lewis, and I currently reside in San Diego, California. And yeah, I'm currently, I just finished up my doctoral program, and I am a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist and a yoga teacher. And yeah, that's basically where I'm at in the world. Very cool. So I'm starting a new business, and yeah. And... Where did your journey begin? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Well, I was born and raised in Alabama, a really small city called Enterprise, and in the southeast portion of Alabama. So we lived on a farm and had that upbringing, and it was it was amazing. Um, I hadn't had much of experience outside of being in a small town. So as soon as I was old enough, I moved to Atlanta. And was there for a few years doing medical school, thinking that was my path. Um, That's whenever you're born and raised in Alabama, you kind of don't have a lot of exposure to alternative health care and the different fields that those things can embody. So when I knew that I wanted to be some type of healer or caregiver, the only construct that I had was traditional medical school. So I did that for a few years and realized that it just wasn't for me. It felt like I wasn't having the um, opportunities to actually go into preventative medicine and have that one-on-one patient care like I wanted. There's a lot of pressure in um, traditional medical school to go in and out, see as many patients as you can. And for me, I just didn't feel like I had that freedom and I didn't want to be that type of practitioner. So mm-hmm. yeah, I took a term off and then uh, came over to San Diego with my ex to just take a break and see what it was about and completely fell in love with the people and, you know, the land and the ocean here and yeah, and found an amazing alternative medical school here that I transferred into. And yeah, I had to drop out of med school and have a lot of money that... <laughs> didn't get me a degree. So it was a really hard transition from that med school to here, Mm -hmm. but I have zero regrets. So I'm so happy doing what I'm doing now. 
how did how did you discover the alternative options in um, healing and in medicine? Yeah, so it's really funny actually. The school that I was in in Atlanta, um, it was called Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. So it stood for we called it PCOM. So every time we would type in that to our Google when we were doing our courses, this other school popped up, and it's the school that I transferred into actually. So they're both called PCOM. The one that I just graduated from is Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. So whenever I was here visiting, I actually just told my partner at the time that I wanted to step in and see what it was all about. And I went and had my my first acupuncture treatment and met the most incredible people there. And it just was a very like, I'm at home type of feeling. And mm-hmm. um, But yeah, before that, I had just looked into different alternative I basically put it into Google yeah <laughs> I was like uh, what other alternatives are there like how else can I be a healthcare provider but not do it in this you know the way that I have been and yeah my partner was he was from Belgium and he had more experience in alternative medicine so he kind of helped direct me into exploring these avenues and I was diving into yoga a lot at that time too mm-hmm so, so yeah, I kind of stumbled upon it all when I was focusing on my own like spiritual evolution and self care, and it kind of just like plopped in my lap. So yeah, for people who don't know, what is under the umbrella of alternative medicine and treatments? Yeah, so it can really embody different things. Um, what I specifically do, as I said, I do acupuncture and um, herbology. So prescribing natural herbs as medicine instead of pharmaceuticals, mm-hmm. which as most people know, have a lot of side effects or, you know, dependency issues that come along with that. So that's Chinese medicine is what I practice. You can also do homeopathy and, um, or be like a naturopathic doctor. And in those cases with, being a naturopathic physician, you're able to prescribe medicines, but being more mindful about what you're prescribing. Mm -hmm. And also you can do injections like B12 injections. And basically the focus with alternative medicine is on prevention of disease versus just treating the symptoms as they arrive. Because Mm -hmm. in allopathic medicine, they're great, which is traditional medicine. They're great at diagnoses and prescribing drugs and fixing symptoms, but oftentimes you still have an underlying cause that's not being recognized and it's not being treated. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a patient continuously coming in for things that could have been treated if you would have, you know, started off at the beginning and focused on prevention. And it's harder. You have to have patients that are obviously you know, committed to their health because it often involves diet and lifestyle changes. But you feel so much better as a person from doing those. Yeah. And you save money on medical bills in the future. So I think that it's much more common in Europe, as you pointed out, and also in California, like maybe coastal states, to Mm -hmm. um, go to a more natural approach to medicine and wellness. Coming from like Alabama, what have been the biggest differences you've seen in how the general population views medicine and health? And has that changed from when you first left Alabama to when you've gone back recently? Yeah, it's definitely changed. Um, I mean, like I said, they're just, they didn't have, and we still don't have um, any alternative practitioners out there, um, especially in a small city where I'm from. If you go Mm -hmm. to the bigger cities, you may find it, but it's, it's really sad because we're not even allowed to practice or I could not legally practice my medicine in the state of Alabama legally. Like the state has ruled, um, legislation that does not allow me to practice what I do. And hopefully that's changing. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, year by year, more states jump on board, but there are a few Alabama being one of them, where I can't legally practice. So that's really sad. But if they were there, I feel like people are definitely open to it. Mm -hmm. Even from when I've started the program, 
I've had pe- so many people from my hometown begging me to move back and have someone there that offers this medicine. So I think it's more about them just not being educated on what's out there mm-hmm. and not having people around. I think they're open to it 100%. It's yeah. not like they're like, oh, that's that's crazy. Um, they just haven't, and America as a whole has yet to really understand the science of what alternative medicine can offer. But luckily, there's a lot of research coming out um, each month, especially in the past few years, that are proving the efficacy of what we do in the scientific community. Mm-hmm. So we can expect there to be more insurance coverage coming up and more of a federal recognition of what we do, which is which is exciting. But yeah, for Alabama, in regards to the health question, it's I was having a conversation with my uh, nurse friend too, and she's from uh, the area around Atlanta. And she's dealing with a similar thing, realizing that it's harder for people or people on the West Coast specifically. um, They're more mindful of what they put in your bodies and the lifestyle that comes along with that. And when you go to smaller places, especially the Southeast, you see, you know, in general, more of an unhealthy diet and not a big focus on on health and the way that I see it. Mm-hmm. If there is, it's more about like calorie restrictions or yeah. carbohydrates versus like, you know, the full body picture. Mm-hmm. What about the full body picture do you wish more people knew? <laughs> yeah, I just think as American culture and around the whole world, I mean, especially as women, since this podcast is about powerful women, ladies, um, I think we're told from a really early age that health and beauty is about the way that we look and it's about the weight on the, you know, how much you weigh or anything of that nature. And it's just like stepping away from that, especially as women and understanding that our health does not equal our weight and does not equal our calorie and carbohydrate intake. And yeah, for me, it's about having a, I'm all about intuitive dieting. So really honoring what your body's wanting instead of restricting certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like when you do that, you end up overcompensating later. And yeah, I think it's just all about being tapped in with what your body is wanting and honoring that. And most of the time that's movement. And most of the time that's being outdoors and, you know, it's a natural antidepressant (laughs) being out in nature, especially in Southern California with our amazing weather. But yeah, for me, the whole body picture is just, you know, be mindful of what you're putting in your body and seeing food as medicine because it is. Mm -hmm. And also moving your body and just dance with whatever it is right for you and not necessarily going to the gym, but just honoring movement and how that can bring you joy. And I'm a huge component of like, you don't need to go to the gym if you're not a gym person. Mm -hmm. Like go dance. You can go on a hike. You can go, there's different ways to honor your desire for movement. What are your favorite ways to be in motion? Definitely dancing. <laughs> yeah. Big dancer. I really like, uh, I think you guys have it in LA as well, but the ecstatic dance community is something that I'm really passionate about. It's basically um, a group of people that come together and they're all over the world it's an incredible community, but you come together and you have hours of dancing um, and anything's allowed. Like you just, it's everyone that's there is expressing themselves so freely and it inspires you to do the same things, things that you would never do. I mean, you can look like a crazy person and no one's going to sit there and judge you or you won't get any weird stares. It's just a very openness um, and freedom and acceptance and you're not allowed to talk on a dance floor. So once you enter the dance floor, you're not allowed to communicate through words. You can do sounds, but it's no talking. So it's all about being your body and expressing whatever comes up. And it's a great workout. (laughs) I'm like sweating and huffing because I'm like, you know, doing crazy African dances and going, doing jazz stuff and contemporary, like all the things within uh, the same few hours. So yeah, that's my... It's my favorite. It sounds like a six-year-old's dream activity. Yep. (laughs) 
Yeah, and and I, yeah, I for your, your inner child. Yeah, and I, I don't think we honor that enough in the in regards to we focus so much on you know um, wellness and our work and our relationships, but we often forget to incorporate play into our mm-hmm. routines, and it changes everything when you are like, I just had a blast. Like that was so much fun. Yeah, a hundred percent, especially in these events, you're like completely sober and it's not, you know, you don't have to go in and drink or do drugs to feel that sense of like ecstasy and, mm-hmm. and play and just honoring that little child who wants to come out and just, you know, express themselves. Yeah. But yeah, totally. Super cool. When, you know, I've done acupuncture and you go into it and it's hard to find, you know, an acupuncturist that you vibe with and to really know, like, why do I go to an acupuncturist? Like, what are the benefits? So for people who are unfamiliar with it and what they can get from it, um, how would you explain it to someone? Um, yeah, firstly, going off of exactly what you said, like, it's it's hard to find the right person. And you find that with a lot of alternative practitioners chiropractors, naturopaths, um, there's not as much of a standardized way of treatment, so which is beautiful because that means that different practitioners have the freedom to treat in their own authentic way um, with the same medicine. But I make sure to tell everyone, even if they're not coming to me, to make sure that you, know, you try a few different people. If a lot of people go to one person and they can be really aggressive needlers and it could be like not a great experience and they don't have warm energy. And then they automatically are like, Oh, that's not for me. Mm-hmm. And same thing with chiropractors. And you just need to find that right person that you vibe well with. And yeah, it can be a beautiful, you know, patient practitioner relationship from that point. Mm-hmm. But in regards to what acupuncture and, and herbal medicine um, offers and what I do specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't understand it's a four-year postgraduate degree. Some people yeah. are like, oh, it's like a vocational school and you, you, know, you train for a year or two. And a lot of the scientific community and America as a whole, I don't think they fully understand or know uh, how much training that we go to mm-hmm. or go through not only on the Chinese medical side, but also biomedicine. It's a pretty dense um, biomedical curriculum that's involved because they're kind of wanting our culture to shift more into integrative medicine to where we're going to be able to collaborate with more uh, medical doctors, mm-hmm. which I think is the future. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a dense, it's a dense uh, curriculum. It's definitely different from medical school, but it's harder in a lot of ways as well because there's a big emphasis on self-work and self-growth and self-awareness as well. We do a lot of Qigong meditation courses and there's a big focus on what we say, heal or heal thyself. It's um, a quote and it's all about to be able to kill other people first, you have to be an embodiment of that. So there's a lot of focus on that. And once you're out of the program, yeah, acupuncture, it was a uh, news to me as well about all the things that it can treat. And then I've seen it treat in my practice and in my internships. But yeah, it's not just a lot of people just think it's chronic pain or acute pain or good for injuries of that nature. And it is scientifically shown to benefit those things. But what I love treating even more are the more chronic conditions that um, come up specifically around mental health and mm-hmm. depression, anxiety, insomnia. Um, I mean, the pain works as well. I mean, we see cases from a lot of arthritis cases to things with disc herniations in the back, especially as American culture, how our posture is just always looking at our phone mm-hmm. or always in that downward. And so it's a lot of it's postural alignment as well. And you can do that through needles and through nutritional lifestyle counseling that we do. And yeah, it's a different way to look at the body, but basically we can attempt to treat all the things. Yeah. (laughs) So, and in it's different way because the way that the Chinese medical community looks at things is 
everything is connected in your body and we break things down into five elements and it's all about, like I said before, treating the cause. Mm -hmm. And normally a lot of a patient's symptoms can be from one root cause. So instead of just putting a Band-Aid or giving herb for the symptom, we're doing that while also constantly treating the root cause. Yep. I had a really great naturopath who also did acupuncture um, and Chinese medicine when I was living in Germany. And it was the first experience I had of a person who spent time with me, who wanted to know everything, who asked a lot of questions, who like I was instead of having five minutes maybe with the doctor, it was easily a 20 minute time just with her before we would start figuring out what was the best treatment method. And it was so refreshing to be listened to and for her to remember what my life was about and remember what my concerns were and my commitments. And she, like, I honestly have felt great going to her. Like I initially went for stress and I kept getting sick and she did, she did the, um, the pressure point balls. I don't remember what their technical name is on my ears. Okay. And after we oh, did Oh, yeah, the auricular seeds. Yes, yes, yeah. the seeds. Thank you. And um, mm-hmm. we did a we did an acupuncture session. She left the seeds in, and I didn't know anything about it, so I thought she actually left, like, little needles in my ear. And it was – we had some translation issues, as you can imagine. But um, <laughs> she's like, just leave them there until the tape falls off. Like, just don't, don't mess with them. Mm-hmm. And – I felt the next day, I felt the best I have and calmest I have probably ever felt in my entire life. Like for a whole week, whatever happened, like rolled off my back. Everything was awesome. I was like, how do you bottle this? Because I would take it every day. (laughs) Um, But it was just, you just felt good and knew that everything was going to work out. I'm like, how is this happening because of seeds that are on my earlobes? Like, what is going on? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, the entire ear is represented. Like you can just do what we call auricular treatments, and it's needles that are just put in the ear. And they do that often for detoxing for people who are coming off of opiates or or coming off of different drug addictions. They have addiction clinics where they strictly do a protocol for the ear that, yeah, like you said, it it works. And the seeds are also great for people who aren't a fan of needles because. Mm Like you said, it's a little seed. It's a herbal seed and it has a piece of tape and you put it on specific points in your ear and it can help anything from sleep to anxiety to just a overall detox or reset. And yeah, I'm glad you got to experience that. Yes. And like, and I'm always curious, like how, how does the acupuncture like work? How is it that just our ears have so many opportunities to transform things that are going on in our body and minds? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, I get asked that question a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's probably at least like seven solid scientific, like reasoning behind that. Yeah. And, but when it comes to the ear, that's mostly for the body. When it comes to the ear, it's, there's not much research done except for that it works, not how it works. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue with a lot of, you know, people that want proof and they want to understand the mechanism before being like, okay, I can get behind it. Um, but there's incre- there's countless PubMed articles talking mm-hmm. about strictly ear acupuncture for different things and seeing how the results are there and the proof is there. But in regards to what's happening inside the body, it's it's not as, you know, as clear. And that's the issue with why things aren't being as you know, accepted mm-hmm. in our culture. Um, but yeah, uh, with the body points, it can be countless different things yeah. that they've discussed. Um, yeah. And I'd be willing to follow up with you on the sure. specific, um, <laughs> places later on, but I have a whole entire workshop that I've led talking about the science and the articles behind that. But I don't have that directly in front of me. So. No, that's okay. But but for everyone listening, essentially, um, you know, you probably people have probably seen the maps of like your feet, right? Where like different parts of your feet relate to different parts of your body. And I've seen this similar mm-hmm. mapping for your ear. But in essentially, yeah. because of the 
whether it's, you can correct me as I'm saying this, but whether it's nerve endings or energy flow, there's different points that connect back to other parts of your body because of how it's all connected in a, as a universe that allows you yeah. to treat one area that you wouldn't expect to solve another. Um, and acupuncture in general would be about like opening those f- channels or moving energy to a channel based on where you're putting a needle. Is yeah, that, okay. you're yeah, 100% correct. And with okay. the ear, it's, you look at it like an inverted fetus. So the body, let's say like your heel and your toe is on the top of your ear and your head and your face are at the bottom of your ear. So that's the way everything is like an inversion. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you can put a point in your ear to fix a, you know, pain in your toe. And it's the same thing for toe pain. If you have toe pain, you know, you could do a point on your elbow or, you know, on your finger to treat that. So it's really interesting. Like someone comes in for back pain and mm-hmm. I'm putting needles in the back, but I'm also putting needles in the lower part of their legs. And it's all going to open up that same channel because what we see in Chinese medicine is pathology comes from a blockage or a deficiency in a channel. So you can unblock it by needling certain points and you can also strengthen it by needling at other points as well. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal. What is the craziest um, solution that you've seen come out of acupuncture, either from what you've learned or what you've seen yourself? Cra- craziest solution? being like the most dramatic. Yeah. Well, cupping. <laughs> well, I worked at a I worked at an HIV clinic um, during my internship, mm-hmm. and we had a. There's, we also do cupping therapy in Chinese medicine, which mm-hmm. most people are more familiar with. You have these like bruise shaped circles on your back. Yep. Um, and that's really great for releasing fascia off the muscle, bringing blood flow, and also bringing out toxins in the skin. Mm-hmm. And with HIV patients, they, the certain patient I had was um, having chronic low back pain, and she's had that for years and years and years. And she wanted cupping done. And normally it was, it was, I put it on, had the markings and, you know, she would come back, she would feel better for like a week, but then she'd want, you know, cupping done again. And so one time I did that on her and did it, left it a little bit longer and it was a really intense reaction. Um, there were some blistering and we did the, all the precautions that you have to do with HIV patients and we're really mindful of, you know, keeping her immunity safe and mm-hmm. also making sure that fluids weren't exchanged. But after that, she had no pain for months. Like she kept coming in just like that did the trick. Like I've never felt so good. And it was just crazy because she had been, she didn't get, she didn't like to be needled. So we could only do cupping therapy, mm-hmm. but to see that one thing happen, have like a severe reaction and then have her be completely pain free. It was, it was pretty awesome. That and fertility cases. I'm really, I specialize in women's health and it's, yeah, it's amazing to see things being done, like especially in when someone is also going through the IVF process, Mm -hmm. but even when they're not having someone who has not been able to have children for four or five years, come in and do a regimen for, you know, six months with us and then be able to get pregnant for me, that just like gives me so much joy. Yeah, you know, seeing, being able to be a part of that, and you know, having them, yeah, be able to make make a babe. So mm-hmm. makes me happy. Well, I'm always caught off guard by how poorly we talk about women's health in general, and how poorly we prepare women through, like, through um, school about like what women's health really is. Like I was stunned at having gone to college and grad school and considering myself like a educated person that when it came to my own body, it was embarrassing like how little I knew about what was happening. And a friend of mine, when she was trying to get pregnant, showed me this book that was all about like the reality of women's health and what we go through and our transformations at different points in our time. And I knew of it in general, but there's so much stuff that we, I feel like the general population isn't aware of that was common sense in history to everybody. Mm -hmm. 
what is your opinion about that? And like, where do you see opportunities for furthering like women's health and awareness to the population? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's it's sad. I feel like historically we used to be way more connected to our wounds and to our cycles. And now I not saying it's patriarchy, but <laughs> I just feel like there's been a lot of shaming done around women's sexuality and sensuality and our cycles. And it used to not be that way. And it makes me sad, but I feel like there is a movement that women are becoming more educated and are starting to, you know, connect with their cycles again. And yeah, for me, I think that it all changed to me. There's also things around the world called red tents. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, what is that? It's a gathering. They, I'm sure they have one in LA too. Uh, they have a few here in San Diego. But it's a gathering of women that come together. It's like a women's circle, but it's all based around um, where they are in their cycle. And it's basically like a woman's, a woman's like a circle mm-hmm. where you're talking about your emotions and you're just, you're seeing one another and you're honoring where each other's at. And yeah, but it was all based around the premise that whenever people used to have, be on their cycle, they had to go into a red tent for them to bleed. And they weren't able to be outside of that until they were done. And it's like reclaiming that as, you know, seeing that as our, our right. And that's, you know, getting connected to that. And so, yeah, it's a really, it's a really cool thing. People listening should look into red tin in their area if it's something you're called to, but either way. Yeah. I think that it also as, even as teenagers we're taught that pain is normal in our cycle mm-hmm. and it's not. And that was something that transformed my life doing Chinese medicine as well, because I was always told that, Oh, you know, if you have a really painful cycle here, you can get on birth control to help like regulate it, or you can take all this to not have cramping. And I was like, okay, everyone goes through this. So it's fine. I'll just put some, you know, take some pamper and or might all and it'll be okay. Yeah. And then once I started really getting in touch with my cycle and learning ways, holistic ways to prevent that from happening and different herbs to take and different imbalances in my body that were actually causing the cramping, it, you know, dissipated. And Mm -hmm. there are times where I'm not as great on my (laughs) regimen and then sometimes they still come up. But as a whole, I went from being in excruciating pain to having a pain-free cycle and being able to regulate my cycle in a natural way. And I think a lot of people are just like, okay, well, I don't have a normal cycle or also I don't want to get pregnant. So let me get on birth control. And there's countless studies coming up about how birth control can mess with our um, hormones as well. And I've been on it. So I don't judge people who do. It's just being mindful that there could be consequences to having those types of things put in your body every day and not allowing your body to Mm self-regulate. So And also being able to be in touch with, you know, your basal body temperature and checking that throughout your cycle and knowing when you're ovulating to a T normally. And even then just knowing where you're at in your cycle can bring you a lot more awareness to like where you're at in your body as well. And I feel like that a lot of women have see it as this, oh, I'm dreading this thing that comes every month and oh, it's going to be this and it's shameful. And I've had like, an entire new outlook on my cycle. And I'm also a huge component of menstrual cups or at least organic tampons because Mm -hmm. it's really sad that people that aren't using that are possibly putting carcinogens into their vagina. (laughs) And uh, people don't know that. People are just out there buying normal tampons every, every month and not knowing they could potentially be putting chemicals into their body. Mm -hmm. So, I'm I'm really happy that you said about the menstrual cup because I found out about the menstrual cup years ago from one of my very close uh, girlfriends and the menstrual cup has transformed my life. Um, It has Mm -hmm. made such a huge difference. I do not buy tampons or pads anymore. I solely rely on the menstrual cup and it's comfortable. It's so easy. Um, and I think everyone who hasn't used it should use it and like starting now. <laughs> yeah. 
It's such 100% a, agree. Yeah, it's it's so and there's so many different variations of the menstrual cups. I mean, you can buy the ones, uh, the diva cup at like Walmart mm-hmm. and Target for it's a it's pricey. That's probably why it's not going well. But there are other companies that I have found on Instagram who just specialize in different shapes and variations of the cup in a reasonable price range. But no, it's huge. I feel so much better using it, and even my cramps have gone down. Yeah. And it's cheaper. I mean, you have one and you can reuse it. Oh, yeah. And you don't have to keep buying tampons. You can just keep your cup and just sanitize it. You can boil it in water mm-hmm. um, or you can you know, wash it with a chemical free soap. And you use the same thing every single time. And it doesn't decrease mucosal lining. So you're not having that dryness. Mm-hmm. And you're able to like see your blood. And then for me, that's a really beautiful thing because you get, you don't see it soaked up. You see like the consistency and then it can also tell you things about where your body's at. And yeah, I, I recommend it to everyone. Sometimes people complain about the leaks happening, but if you learn how to insert it the right way, then you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. But I'm with you. It revolutionized my entire world. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like telling everyone about it. Like, come on. Yeah. And it's not a lot of people who have been negative about it. They're like, oh, I can't do that because like, I can't see blood or I can't do this. And honestly, I thought I would be really creeped out at it too. But like to see the cup and to see like what my body has done uh, has like I love my body more. <laughs> it's yeah. the weirdest. It's the weirdest reaction, but to know that, like, I know my days to a T now and what to expect. Yep. So, yep. well, I, I think like anything in your life, um, we're learning so much, especially recently. It's it's such a forefront of how you can't rely on other things and other people to tell you what you need to eat or what you need to do for exercise or how you should be like how you should be in touch with your body or even like your finances for crying out loud like you doing your own research and study about yourself and like what's really so for you is so important because everybody is so different and like what works for other people may or may not work for you it may not make sense for who you are and what you're up to um i mean there's even you know People who say that you can only, you know, you only get pregnant at these times and this time, but you never know when you're actually ovulating unless you do this, do the work yourself. Um, yeah. You know, our sister, when she got pregnant with her second son, I think both of them, she's like, everyone told me you couldn't get pregnant right after your period. She's like, I did every time. She's like, I was not expecting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was just based on like what her cycle was like. Um, so it's, if anyone isn't doing their own personal research in regards to their uh, cycle and even like how foods interact with them, like please start doing your own research. Like keep a journal, write it down because the more informed you are about how you work, it'll allow you to find simple ways to live your best life that don't involve having to download, you know, a thousand dollar course or other things that, you know, where people are spending money to look for answers. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's so many, and I'm sure a lot of people already have like a lot of people have the period tracker, which is like a step one. This is when my cycle is supposed to be, and this is when I'm potentially ovulating. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I mean, in general, the luteal phase and follicle phases of our cycle, they're pretty standardized, but some people aren't. So knowing that tracking your, you know, body temperature each morning can tell you when you're ovulating specifically Mm -hmm. and living your life accordingly. So yeah, I'm all about that. Learn about your own body. How, how do you incorporate um, food and what you consume into your wellness and then also your advice for the women that you treat? Yeah, I, I mean, I personally don't eat meat, so I'm a vegetarian and that's very uncommon in the Chinese medical field because Chinese doctors like their meat mm-hmm. and see it as being really healthy. And that's because in Chinese culture in China, their meat is a lot different than our meat. Just like all a lot of like European breads are different than our breads. Yeah. So, and they have a very low meat diet to begin with. So it's not like here where you're going to like steak dinners and it's like a tiny little thing of green beans or potato. Um, you don't see that there, but uh, so there is a, kind of a pressure for 
some people doing Chinese medicine to make sure that female is getting a lot of decent meats, red meats and white meats. And during her cycle, I personally don't recommend that because I love animals, but to each their own, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, in regards to things that they eat, in regards to fertility, we see a lot of things like dairy intake being associated with it and things that can cause what so things like cold roll foods like ice cream and dairy and things like that can have a negative impact on your reproductive health basically Mm -hmm. and we also break down the our cycle into four different stages um we have chi blood yin and yang and during those cycles you can have different foods and do different things that help you in that quarter. And yeah, I'd be willing. It's more, it's easier to see when it's on a picture. Sure. Um, But but yeah, it's, it's, there's different foods at different levels of your cycle that are good for you. But in general, it's about staying away from dairy mostly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And we can include a visual. Um, if you, if you send me one, we can add one to your podcast show notes so everybody can, can see exactly what that looks like. One of the things that worries, worries me about, um, food in regards to women in particular are when we look at the sources of where we're getting, um, different foods and meat in particular, all of the hormones that can be added to, Uh, traditional American meat processing. And then to think that you're taking hormones on top of that and creating your own on top of that, it makes me nervous knowing, you know, if you're not being really selective about the meat you're eating, how it's impacting you, particularly as a female. Yeah, I 100%. Like with all foods, really, I'm a big advocate on know your source of what you're buying. Mm-hmm. And that's with vegetables too, but especially when it comes to meat. I mean, especially if people listening are in California, then I'm 100% certain that there is some kind of market, drivable distance that has organic grass fed meat mm-hmm. that you can know the butcher, you can know where it comes from, you know what's going into the meat. And it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, playing Russian roulette here in America when it comes to food, because yeah. if you're not you know, aware it could just, yeah, you're pumping hormones into your body and it's so much being done in the recent years that there's not a lot of studies yet about how it's negatively impacting women and men also. Mm -hmm. And so knowing where those things are coming from is, is really important. And if we're going to eat meat, then yeah. I mean, whenever I go back to Alabama, I do eat meat with my family because we live, well, we had a farmhouse and they would go and they would hunt and whatever they brought back, I would eat, you know, and cause for me, it's just about how things are being raised yeah. and, you know, and the slaughterhouses that are around America. So yeah, knowing the source of what you're getting, like a, because of what's being put into the meat and also how the animals are being treated for me, it's like the energy of it. Like I do, I want to eat a pig that was just like, you know, living its entire life in this like really unsanitary Thing on top of like you know all these other creatures and mm-hmm. yeah I, just, I would rather it come from a place that you know they have more space and they're not being like abused the entire time you yeah. know and not being pumped full of things that might not be great for your body and not being fed things that they wouldn't normally eat like that's always blows my exactly. mind of like why do we think we're going to get quality meat when you're feeding the animal stuff that they would never eat on their own free will I'm, yeah, we lived for a while in Central Coast, California, and there would be these um, ranches with cows that had oceanfront views on these hills and vistas. <laughs> and I remember they had um, there's a commercial out of like happy cows come from California and happy cheese comes yeah. from happy cows. And there are many farms in the U.S. that care about their animals and take care of them and do things the right way. Unfortunately, that's not most of where we're getting any of our sources from, whether it's at a restaurant or in a traditional grocery store. So I'm really happy that more people are getting aware of poly farms and people who actually care about the animals. I'm really glad that California passed um, the um, humanitarian standards or the new Mm -hmm. standards for animals being raised in California, like no cages. And I forget what's fully in the law that just got passed, but I was really glad that that went through. 
Um, and I'm glad now that when even if you go and buy eggs, you can buy like happy eggs and they talk to you about the like where the chickens come from because it always blows my mind when you see organic vegetarian fed chickens because yeah. <laughs> chickens are carnivores like they eat grubs and insects and they can even take out like small animals so yeah if we're feeding them vegetarian food that means you're just giving them most likely like shit corn based meal and they never get to be their like animalistic selves it'd be like you know joe rogan makes a great joke about like hashtag vegan cat and how these <laughs> poor yeah these like poor cats that are being forced to vegan diet from their vegan owners are you know not living very long and just look sad because they never get to eat what they want. <laughs> so he has a whole bit in like his new special about it. It's quite funny. Um, yeah. I mean, vegetarian people can be, I mean, I can say this. I've not like, I've never been one of those, like, I don't know. I am veg vegetarian. I was vegan for a while, but there's some people that just force it down your throat. And I understand because I'm so passionate about like why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you, like with my dog as well. Like I do feed her vegetarian dog food, but I also feed her meat. Like, right. And that's part of what she is designed to do. And it's like, I don't want to project my own things onto an animal who has no say in the matter, you know? Right. And, and I think like um, often eating um, a vegan or vegetarian diet is going to allow you to one, be more aware of what's in the food and to make sure that it's whole food. Like having a vegetarian mm -hmm. dog food means that you probably can read everything that's on the label versus other dog foods. Um, and I think that there, we get so caught up whether it is keto or vegan or vegetarian or like all these different options that people have nowadays I just want people eating more vegetables. Like I don't like I don't, I don't care where else you want to fall on the spectrum of food, but to think that eighty percent of what we consume should be vegetables and um, you know things from the earth that we can see and buy directly as they are at the store, and that's not common. Like it 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 blows my mind yeah. how common sense has gone out the window and it's no longer common. Yeah, it's sad. And I think like even with the keto diets and the paleo and stuff of that nature, I think that a lot of people think that means health. And it's just, it can get you to be more mindful about what's going into your body. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like nutritional counseling, like you said, it's like just eat more vegetables and do these small things. And when you're very strict on a certain type of diet style, it's probably not going to be something you're going to that's going to be sustainable in your life. Yeah. So for us, it's about what's compliant. Like, how are they going to be compliant on this as a lifestyle? It's not about a diet. It's a mm -hmm. lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. it's choosing that what you put in your body is meant to feed you and heal you and not clog your arteries and not make you sluggish. You know, it's, yeah. you're choosing every single meal that you have. And I like, you know, it's I like sweets and I like, I indulge. But still, like with meals, you sit down and you can look and be like, this is going to nourish me. This is giving me... Like all of, all of these, even with vegetables, there's so much protein in vegetables that people just don't have that awareness. There's so yes. much protein. But knowing where it's come from and cooking it and having a relationship with the food and like, I don't know, it can be a beautiful, it's a beautiful art for me, cooking and, you know, finding different ways to, and it's so colorful as well. Yeah. <laughs> like vegetables are so colorful. Well, and I love the ability also to honor how, many people had to get the food to you. Even if you are, you know, whether you're getting your produce from a co-op, you're getting it from a traditional store, there are so many people involved and in, like hard work and intention and caring about what they were doing in order for me to eat. And being present to that really changes how you look at food as well. Like it's, it's hard to, um, like binge and not even consider the food you're putting in your body when you think about like, how did I, how did this get here? How many people were involved? Um, and just be grateful that somebody was willing to spend their day doing that instead of something else. Yeah. That's funny. You say that I, I'm not religious anymore, but I was raised very religious. And so, you know, you'd pray before meals, every meal. Mm -hmm. And my ritual now has become, you know, putting my hands like over the food and like what you just said, like thinking where it came from, like thinking the people who created it, thinking the soil that grew it, like thinking about the light that had to be, you know, 
given to this plant to be able to grow and just being really connected to that and mm-hmm. grateful for the food that you're putting in your body. Yeah. It changes the relationship with your food and yeah, it's, it makes it even more enjoyable. It does. Um, Jesse had a friend whose mother died of cancer and at the end, like she couldn't eat and she, she had to be fed through a tube and the hardest all she wanted was to eat. <laughs> like it was heartbreaking. And so her son started doing this thing where every time he had a meal, he would give it away to her, like spiritually mm. give, give it to her. And so Jesse and I have adopted that where, you know, we're looking at who are we giving this food away to? And it becomes this hybrid of giving it away and giving thanks all at once for like, yeah, like I get to eat today. Everyone doesn't get that. And we forget <laughs> that everybody doesn't get to have all of these meals. And we get so caught up in making eating convenient and fast and like jamming it into our day when I think if people just wanted to do an easy stress relief activity, my advice would be to take time and in preparing and enjoying the meals that you get in a day. Like you're not going to get all the benefits that you would get of sitting down with a meal and, you know, maybe having conversation with somebody and going through the cooking process as you would if you're you know, eating as fast as you can a uh, granola bar and then yeah. rushing to something else. Yeah, and I think with America too, it's all about, it's been a matter of convenience with most people. I mean, I tend to have a different type of lifestyle, mm-hmm. but I would say the majority of Americans have a nine to five. They're in the corporate world. They come home and they still have more work to do. And it's a very work heavy type of like priority in our in our lives. Yeah. And with that becomes, oh, is it convenient? How long is it going to take? And it's so easy to debt for diet just to be swept under there and be like, okay, fast foods or this canned soup or this, you know, bar and not saying you can't have those things, but at least one meal a day where you're really putting that intention in. I mean, for some people, even that's a jump, right. but you have to start somewhere. So I think some people can get really shocked or put off whenever you're like, okay, you know, have two meals where you're cooking and you're doing this. And for people that don't cook and for people who have, you know, never had that relationship with food, Mm -hmm. it can seem like, oh no, that's just not going to happen. Right. I'm way too busy. And yeah, there are options. There are also places that can deliver your food to your house. I think it's called Freshly something. I don't know. But they deliver these goods to your house and tell you how to make it and it's all whole food based Mm -hmm. and there's a few different ones and they tell you how to cook it and it can be healthy foods and you can also start to form that relationship with the food with an instruction guide so it takes a little bit off your back too and you don't have to go shopping for the groceries yeah we were doing purple carrot for a while which is a a vegan place um like food delivery program and Sorry, retake that line. You said vegan blazed. Oh, <laughs> Purple Carrot, a vegan-based um, food program, and actually it's supported by Tom Brady because um, he's adopted the mindset of 80-20, 80% uh, vegan, gluten-free, and then 20% whatever happens. Because I think it's unrealistic to, to your point of going 100% into anything in modern-day world because mm-hmm. – especially if you're someone who travels and has a lot of things that you're up to, there's going to be moments when you don't have any choices. Like we were talking previously in the last podcast about, you know, traveling to abroad for work. And when you show up in Asia and you're meeting with, um, you know, team members there, you often don't get even get a choice on what food shows up in front of you. It just gets presented And you're like, okay, well, I can try something new and I can, you know, try and adhere as best I can to my lifestyle. And like, like, it's not a big deal. Like it's, it's better to be with these people right now and to have this experience than to stress out about the fact that I might not know what is in this thing I'm about to eat. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's really hard for I mean, myself included, I, even when I was super strict about it, I like, I wasn't at my happiest. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just about, yeah, I think the 80, 20 rule is, is a great rule, especially for people who are, you know, not about that strict kind of compliance to what they want. And I think that everyone should be able to have a bowl of ice cream sometime and have a piece of pizza if they want, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's all about 
not shaming yourself and guilting yourself for those moments and also not like overindulging in those things. Yeah. And, and I, and I think the balance again, just like your own personal health, like I hated whenever I was told I had to keep a food journal because I'm like, what? I have to eat it and cook it. Now I have to write it down. Like this is dumb. (laughs) But even if you did it for a week and it doesn't, I'm not worried about people measuring things and every, just write down what you actually put in your mouth and what you drink. Yeah. And, there is always something that surprises me where I'm like, I thought I was doing better than I am. Damn it. Um, but again, yeah. it's just it's just highlighting awareness to what we usually don't pay attention to. Yeah, we do that a lot with patients. We tell them about the food journals and mm-hmm. the same thing. You really don't realize. And the water intake, too. I mean, I'm a huge component of like drinking as much water you can as, as a day, like up to a gallon a day. That's like ideal. Um, but water intake is a huge issue for people with migraines and people with, you know, chronic things that they don't realize it's just their body being not dehydrated, but on that verge, not having enough water. Yep. And yeah, with food as well, there's even an app I have, it's my fitness pal, I think it's called, yep. but mm-hmm. you basically, if you're out and especially when I used to, I still would go to fast foods, more healthy fast foods, but I was in that phase of my life. So if you're at a store, you can just that has, you know, a menu, you can type in what you ate. It can be a food journal, like on your phone. So you're not having to bring around an actual, like, you know, pad and paper. And not only does it tell you or save that information for you, but it also breaks all those down to um, macro and micronutrients for you. So you can see what you're getting out of those foods. And so that's like another level of, you know, just, just being mindful and having that awareness of, oh, I'm not getting enough protein or, oh, mm-hmm. I went over in that. I have too much, have too much sodium. So, yep. yeah. Great point. One of the things that I find really interesting also as if you're tr- being someone who's trying to drink enough water, that there's actually ways that you can not be absorbing the water, even if you're drinking a lot. Um what is your perspective on that and any tips for people who are concerned that they're like, listen, I'm drinking a gallon of water a day and I still feel like it's just going right out of my body. I'm not actually absorbing it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like in Chinese medicine, we view, view fluid metabolism um, a little bit differently. But for us, it's important to incorporate movement and actually have sweat throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that can be, I'm not saying you need to go like run, but even just have, 20 minutes where you're having some type of sweat and that can be a fun way. I mean, if you have a partner and you want to like do it that way, that's great. Yeah. (laughs) Or you can go dance and do anything, but just having some type of movement of that fluid that where it's not just going straight in and then straight out in your urine. Yeah. Um, And also for people who for that don't have, or that do have an issue with um, water intake, definitely just have a bottle, like have, get a reusable bottle that you keep filled and keep it around with you throughout your day. And uh, there's no need for plastic bottles um, that you buy at a store. I get if it's more convenient for you, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. But if you want to save plastic, help the environment and also have more of a convenient permanent bottle in your car or at your work, have it by you, always have it filled and constantly just drink it throughout your day. And when it's empty, fill it up again and, you'll see how easy it is to stay hydrated when you kind of keep that around all the time. Yes. And um, I always recommend if it's an option to go for something that is metal or glass over plastic. Yes. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, I have both. Yeah. Especially if you're going to incorporate any essential oils into it so that you're not taking the toxins out of the bottle and then you're drinking it. Um, That's... That blew my mind when I learned that fact. I was like, oh, God, there are so many people who are not just getting what they think they are when they are drinking out of a a plastic bottle. Even if there's no essential oils in it, but whether it gets hot and cold and the plastic is breaking down. So, yeah. Yeah. Get a glass one or get a, I mean, mine's like an aluminum one and it's, it's so light and it's easy to carry and it has like a nice little suction cup that's fun to drink out of. And so I enjoy drinking it and yep. <laughs> I enjoy having it around with me. So, yeah. So when you're not focused on helping people with their wellness, what are you doing for fun? Like what, what are you, what's the 360 version of you? What's the what version? 360, like the all encompassing version of you. Oh, like, got you. Yeah. I heard three pixie. Oh, that's pixie. also fun. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I like I said, I love to dance. I mean, you and I are in a similar kind of community when like, you know, Burning Man and Festival Life. Yeah. And I really enjoy celebrating life and dancing and um, appreciating house music mm-hmm. <laughs> and all the things that embodies in the community that it brings into my life. So I'm always looking for a different events to dance and celebrate um, at. And meet and, new people. I mean, yeah, that's, that's such a big thing at the, at, at the festivals too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like the people that I've gotten to know and that have become like family to me. It's just, yeah, it's an entire community based on just loving and accepting people where they're at and whatever that means for them and not taking life too seriously and loving more and being more mindful of what we're creating and how to support each other. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's something that's added so much value to my life. But yeah, other than that, I'm doing a lot of yoga and yeah, I like Southern California yoga community is amazing and there's always something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm a nerd, so (laughs) I like to read and watch sci-fi and do all that stuff. I love reading. But I stay really busy. Yeah. When um, when you look at the women's movement today, and there's so many components to it, um, what is your take? What are you excited about? What do you think um, is how it, it could evolve into the future to be even more impactful? Yeah, I mean, I think all of the women here have been really excited about what's happened over the past you know, a few years with the Me Too movement and just people coming forward and not living in fear and shame and really being outspoken and not taking, you know, not allowing suppression to control them any longer. Mm -hmm. And that's made me really excited just for people to reclaim what's rightfully ours and the whole talk around consent and what that means for people and what we've tolerated for so long that should not be tolerable. And I think it's empowering more women to come forward and to say that's not okay and to demand themselves to be respected like we should. Mm-hmm. And it's sad that we even have to do that, but I'm grateful that it's happening so that we can shed light on the issues in our society and even happening worse in other cultures. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think that it's like, for me personally, I feel that it's kind of, I don't know. My hope is that we can start to approach it. I mean, I think that we've been very outspoken and strong voiced with what we're coming together as a whole sex and saying our gender and saying to male and to society figures. At the same time, I want us to be gentle enough to where men can meet us where we're at Mm -hmm. instead of feeling like they have to be put on the defense. I know uh, I personally have a lot of amazing um, divine masculine friends who I just want to see more of a balance. You know, yes. I don't want there to be pointing fingers. I don't want it to be like overcompensating, like, okay, okay. Like there are amazing men out there. And I don't think it's yep. about men versus women. I think that it's about coming together and embodying those two energies perfectly within our own self, you know, yep. and men supporting women to speak their truth. And I think this is a teaching opportunity. And I think a lot of men are stepping forward and saying, okay, yes, tell me. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity for us to tell them instead of just being like, oh, you did this and you guys have to hold on this and that and that. I view feminism like as equals, like it actually is. But I think a lot of people, um, yeah, they can get on their pedestal about, you know, females being more or this and that. And I just think that, the beauty of feminine energy is that gentle spirit as well as our strength. And so giving the men the opportunity to yeah, evolve and change so we can truly meet together. I totally agree. And and, and I'm so lucky that I have so many amazing men in my life who are awesome. And I've been really excited to see them being proud and excited and like, how can I support powerful ladies as well? Because you know, I, I've told a lot of people on the podcast, like I've struggled about what the name was for a long time because I wanted it to be inclusive. And I was finally like, fuck it. I'm just going to have anyone on the show. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> it, like that was a breakthrough for me to just like keep going with it. But um, I think also that the I want the impact of the Me Too movement to let people know that it's not just women who have been 
like keeping a secret about things that have happened to them. Like it's people across the board. Yes. And there's so much opportunity to let people know that there is a community, that they're not alone, that like they're perfect just the way they are. And like if you need to talk about something or want to share something, you can. And um, I'm just more excited that there are people who are – it's not about being a victim. It's about being a survivor and doing it anyway. And like, I look forward to moving to a point where we have less of these like horrific stories coming out and more stories about the amazing things that are coming out of it. And just, you know, if the, I'd rather the future be equal than the future be female. Exactly. Um, with you. And it's exciting too, to see like even in politics, how so many women, have come into office even in this past election um, and people coming forward now. And it's just, yeah, it just makes me happy to see society acknowledging that there is wisdom and power in female form as well. I mean, mm -hmm. regardless of what you believe or what you stand for, it's very evident that America and many other cultures have been dominated by men mm -hmm. <laughs> for the entire of their history. And just, you know, honoring that women can be that too. And so it's exciting to see the Me Too movement as well as all these leaders coming forward and taking office. Yeah. Who have been um, women or people in general who have been really inspiring for you in your journey? Yeah, you know, my grandmother, I think, she she passed a few years ago. She had cancer. Mm -hmm. But she was the embodiment of what a powerful woman is. She <laughs> was just, I mean, we're in Alabama, but she was just a woman who was very outspoken and she was very involved in the church as an elder there, but she is just, like, you, have to, you just have to meet her. She just embodies that strength and mm -hmm. outspokenness in such a fierce way that it was beautiful to have that around me. Both of my grandmothers actually are very much that way, mm -hmm. like outspoken and opinionated and just like going to tell you like it is. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's beautiful to see a non-passive kind of role model as mm -hmm. I was growing up mm -hmm. and my mother as well. A lot of strong, independent women that I was raised around, fortunately. And in regards to like public figures, you know, honestly, this is going to be a, like a funny answer or a very cliche answer. But, like, Ellen DeGeneres is, like, one of my favorite people of all time. For sure. And she deserves she that. <laughs> so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm, like, I'm bisexual, and I dated women in in high school and in college. And coming out in Alabama, I went through a lot of that same thing she went through. I mean, she came out when it was not accepted by society, and she came out in the public eye. Yeah. And went through all of that and was still fierce enough to be, like, this is me. This is who I am. And I love myself enough to be honest with everyone around me and my own self to be loved where I'm at. And seeing her growth and how she gives back to people and her generous heart and mm -hmm. her joyous spirit and how she can make me laugh. And I just watch her show and I just, yeah, it just brings me back into my own humility and all is right in the world for that moment. And yep. it's a very heart opening space. And I just, love what she stands for. I love how she gives back to the world and to animals. And yeah, I just have a lot of respect for her impact on people's lives and my own. Very cool. When you think about your daily routine and like what you're doing to live your best life, are there things that you do every day that are like, this is my plan to set myself up for success? Or what does it look like for you to be like working at your optimal? Yeah, you know, I think uh, there are times at this current moment, I'm in a lot of transition. Yeah. <laughs> so my normal ritual has kind of been, I could just move into a new space. I just started a new job. So my rituals have been a bit off recently. But my normal go-to day routine is I'm really mindful about not pressing the snooze button. And one of my mentors is like, every time that you are pressing the snooze button on your alarm clock, you're not honoring an agreement you made with yourself, you yeah. know, the day before. And so I still do it at times and I even did it this morning. <laughs> so I'm not always great with that, but it is being mindful of like, what is the first energy that I'm putting into my day? Is it like, yes, let's do this or no, no, like later. Mm -hmm. And 
So not hitting the snooze button, button, waking up, making my bed. It's like the first choice for you just tidy up your room yep. and you feel good about it. And you're not like, you know, putting it off till later and you get to come home to a beautiful bed. So I'm all about making your bed as soon as you get up, hydrating, meditate, do like a little yoga flow sequence and tap in with my own intentions for the day. You know, like, what do I want to accomplish? And that can be different things depending on what I have planned for the day, like work versus play. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, it's a lot about how I start my day and it changes everything. If you can like get out to have a dog. So I love being able to go outside and walk her. And yeah, it just, if you can start your day in that way, I feel like the rest of your day is, is always set. And if you can exercise in the morning too, you feel even better because you just started your day like saying yes to health. Even if it's just like a, you know, a 10 minute something, just getting your body moving. Yeah. No, I, I really do think that there's so much power in how you start your day. And I love your comment about like what commitments to yourself are you breaking? Because I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for how much they actually weigh on us, even though we're like, it's okay, it can happen later. But just like when somebody keeps breaking their word with you and it starts to add up, the same thing happens, I think, with yourself, whether it's I'm going to work out today or I'm going to wake up at, you know, 6 a.m. or whatever those things are, um, being mindful of the and honoring what we told ourselves, I think, is just as important as what we've told other people. Yeah, hundred percent. It makes me think of like one of my favorite books of all time, super easy read for anyone who hasn't read it, but it's called the four agreements. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you read it, but it's a really easy read. It's really simple truth. Um, but one of the four agreements that he says is to be impeccable with your word. So that's with yourself as well. So making commitments that you're going to follow through with and that's with yourself and with other people. I totally agree. Perfect. When you look at what you're up to for 2019, what are you excited about and what are you taking on for yourself? Yeah, it's been a big year already. I just started my new business, um, working at a clinic, and I'm really excited about that. I work with an amazing team. I have a chiropractor and naturopathic physician, a lot of um, massage therapists, the yoga studio, and a, a beautiful view on the bay. So I'm really stoked that I've invested the past couple months creating that space and starting to see clientele. And for me, this year is all about committing to that business and committing to, you know, this build in healthcare and seeing what that is for me and starting to make my own products and herbal products, um, not just ones that you can decoct into a tea, but things like salves for your body and, you know, CBD infused pain relief salves. I have Chinese herbs that are painkillers. So diving into that and kind of creating my own product line Mm -hmm. and yeah, hopefully getting to play a bit more now that I'm done with school Yeah, (laughs) and make music. I make music as well. I sing and songwrite. And so I'm trying to finally finish my album, which I've worked on for, I don't know, 10 years, but I've never actually had the time to sit down and record. So that's been my like big checkoff list for this year is to get that done finally. Mm -hmm. So I can finally have part of my art out there for just even myself to enjoy. But it's it's a big big, deal. Beautiful Mm -hmm. catharsis for me. Yeah. How did you get into music? Yeah, I don't really, I I was always into music. I was singing at church at really young age and in middle school and High school, I was involved with show choir, which is like a dancing, singing um, group. And I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And then my parents bought me a guitar, I think, when I was 16, 17. And I already had piano lessons. And from that point on, I just fell in love with playing guitars and writing music. It just kind of, I'm already a little bit of like a poetic person when it comes to things that I journal. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty effortless for me to just like pick up guitar and then have a song come out. And it's like how I process what I was going through and how I, you know, put on pen and paper what was going on in my head and heart. Mm -hmm. And so it's an amazing process for me that I immediately fell in love with. When you, when you look back at your life and you look at what you've overcome, what are some victories that you are proud about that, 
you know you got more of your own personal strength from? Yeah, I think that moving across country was a big one. Yep. I mean, I was from a little town and choosing to drop out of med school and move on the completely other side of the country from everyone I knew. It Everyone was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you just do that? And for me, I mean, it wasn't really a choice. I just felt like this was a heck yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> you know, like how people say it's like a fuck yeah or no. It was like a fuck yeah for me. So I, yeah, I just dropped everything and moved. And, and people say like it took bravery, but for me, it was just like, no, that's like all I could do. It was hundred percent in alignment with what I knew I needed to grow and the people I need to be around, but it did change. It was a big win for me choosing to do that because I got to recreate myself fully and find this incredible community and find what I do now. Mm-hmm. And other than that, I think, I think my karma in this life has always been like, how can I be most authentic and continuously being put in places where I might not and my lifestyle might not be fully accepted. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it was like shaving the side of my head and getting piercings and getting tattoos and coming out to my parents in a culture where it's just not seen often and it's not accepted. It's not fully understood. And so constantly like choosing to do those things because it was authentically me, even though I knew that I may be judged and by the people that I love the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and they ended up not. I mean, my family is amazing. They have their judgments, but it's based in love because they're religious, which is which is fine. But I never felt like fully judged by them. It's funny how much fear we have about being a certain way. And then once we do it and don't really give them a choice, like this is me, yeah. <laughs> then they can really rise to that with time. And I don't think we give enough people credit. And I think that we should give ourselves credit enough to just be authentically ourselves and people that are going to come into our life to love us, they will be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I think giving people the opportunity to rise versus just cutting them off or um, not giving them the opportunity to evolve and change. Because if we don't give them the space to, then nobody's going to, whether they're people we love or people we don't know. Yeah, and that's what I saw in my family too. I just like, I saw like, oh, you're from the South, you're going to take this, you're going to do that. And I just noticed like the more I just was myself, the more they loved me in that, you know, Mm -hmm. and we both became better people for that. And I think that, yeah, we often just don't give people the opportunity to rise and to choose love and to choose acceptance. And they often do. I think it's all like fear-based mentality for us being like, oh no, I just want to be accepted and understood, but Mm -hmm. we can't live our life that way. And be happy, at least. No, and when you when you love somebody, nothing brings you more joy than to see them like in their like all their light shining out. Like nothing's withheld. And when you see them in that moment of happiness and living full out, you're like, okay, yes, now I can be happy because someone I love is in that space. So it's a it's a beautiful thing to be able to see. Yeah, it is. Great. So we ask everybody on the show where they are on the powerful lady scale, zero being average everyday human and 10 being super powerful lady. Where do you feel today and where do you feel on average? I think we're, I think we're all, we all should feel 10. I mean, (laughs) even if you're like not feeling that on a daily basis, I feel like we're all 10s. And the more you say that about yourself, the more you embody that, you know? Yeah. So every day I'm like, that is who I am. I'm like, I'm all about affirmations. I also say a lot of affirmations to myself, but it's telling yourself what you want to be instead of, or what you are instead of what you want to be. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I want to be loved. No, I am loved. Oh, I want to be beautiful. No, I am beautiful. You know, making those things about yourself. So, heck yeah, like the most powerful version, superpower lady. (laughs) Awesome. And then what would you like people to know who are either looking for a path of going um, into the same practice that you are, uh, if they're at that point where they're not sure if they should come out to their family, if they're debating moving across country, like what is your advice for people who are on similar paths as yourself? Yeah, I mean, in regards to what I do as a career or what anyone does as a career, honestly, I mean, for me, I would I could have stayed in medical school and been miserable because that's what I thought success was because that's what I thought my path had to be. 
Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people feel that way, that it's all about making money and it's all, and it is, that's a beautiful perk of having a job, but so few Americans have been able to live their passion and you can, no matter what society tells you, no matter what your family tells you, you can find something that you love and that feeds your spirit and that you can also be rewarded for in money. And so my advice would be for, to find that thing for you. And it's really hard for a lot of people and it takes time and that's okay. It took me time and it took me a lot of wasted or not wasted money, but lost money <laughs> in certain ways through other programs for me to find this path. But so whatever that looks like for you, you can find that and it may take time, but don't mm-hmm. stop searching and don't settle for something where you feel like you are a slave to a system mm-hmm. or you can't be expressed fully in your work. Even if that means having like something on the side that you have a hobby that you're doing that's bringing you joy and still having a normal job, then that's beautiful. But don't let you know society and work drain your body and drain your spirit. And in regards to people wanting to move or to come out and do things that really scare them, my choice or my thing that I always put my questions through um, since like four or five years ago has been, okay, is this saying yes to love or is this saying yes to fear Mm -hmm. and breaking it up like fully in those two choices. And there are some things that can be gray and, uh, but most of the time it's pretty clear. Like, am I not doing this because I'm scared or am I doing this because it's what's best for me and it's going to, you know, help me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when you can ask yourself that question, it becomes clear. And I'm just a big advocate on not allowing fear to control your choices and to control your life. And when we're able to step away from fear, we're allowing the universe to put things that we couldn't even imagine into our lives. And if I would have talked to myself while I was going through that process and seeing where I am now, it's just, it's just crazy to me because I had a certain dream and I had a certain vision and what's come into fruition is so much better than I could even imagine. And, you know, I hope everyone gets there and I continue to want to have my dreams and visions change, you know, as I grow to continuously find different ways to live my best life. And I think everyone, you know, can be there and it just makes you fall in love with life so much more and to have that outlook. I love that. Yep. I totally agree. Um, You never know what's on the other side of jumping through the fear and just going after what brings you joy. And we think we know what looks like an amazing life. And then it's so cool to see other things we never planned for expected to show up that bring us equal joy than what was to what we had planned. Yeah, totally. Well, I am so happy that you were yes to being on the podcast and you're able to share about your journey and what you're up to and that there are options for people out there, who, um, especially in regards to honoring our bodies and our wellness. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's, you know, it's such a beautiful opportunity and an honor to come on and have my story shared and even be able to reflect on my own journey getting here. So I appreciate that opportunity. So thank you. You're welcome. As someone who believes in whole body healthcare and preventative healthcare, I'm so relieved that there are more and more doctors and health practitioners like Lindsay available around the world and especially here in the US. The sooner we can stop treating only the symptoms, but the cause and create lasting changes, the better for all of us and often cheaper for all of us. I myself am guilty of swinging from focused and intentional with my health and wellness to whatever it takes to make it through this day or week. Hello, Del Taco, no sleep and dehydration. I'm also glad that Lindsay was able to share her knowledge about women's health and the smallest ways that we can all take better care of ourselves. I'm also grateful that Lindsay is just as a human all the time and on this podcast, just really authentic about who she is and what she's up to and making sure that how she's living her life and taking care of her patients is really aligned to integrity. To connect with Lindsay, to book your own appointment, to visit her at her wellness center, you can follow her on Instagram at Dr. Lindsay and Lindsay is spelled L-Y-N-S-I. You can follow her office on Instagram at wellness lounge underscore mission bay. Visit www.wellnessloungemissionbay.com and follow her on Facebook at Lindsay Lewis. 
If you'd like to support the work that we're doing here at Powerful Ladies, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Leave a review on any of these platforms. Share the show with all the powerful ladies and gentlemen in your life. Join our Patreon account. Check out the website, thepowerfulladies.com to hear more inspiring stories, get practical tools to be your most powerful, get 15% off your first order in the Powerful Ladies shop, or donate to the Powerful Ladies One Day of Giving campaign. And of course, follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. For show notes and to get the links to the books, podcasts, and people we talk about, go to thepowerfulladies.com. I'd like to thank our producer, composer, and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. She's one of the first female audio engineers in the podcasting world, if not the first. And she also happens to be the best. We're very lucky to have her. She's a powerful lady in her own right, in addition to taking over the podcasting world. She's a singer-songwriter working on her next album, and she's one of my sisters. So it's amazing to be creating this with her, and I'm so thankful that she finds time in her crazy busy schedule to make this happen. It's a testament to her belief in what we're creating through Powerful Ladies, and I'm honored that she shares my vision. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. I can't wait for you to hear it. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love. Hey guys, I'm so excited that you are here today to listen to another episode of the Powerful Ladies podcast. It's because of you guys that we are able to exist and survive and make this great content and have these great conversations. One way that you can really help us out is to go to thepowerfulladies.com and sign up for our newsletter. You will get great information and tips about once a month to know when we're having an awesome sale, when there's a great new course coming out, and just to hear all the cool stuff we're doing. It's the first place to learn about all the events and the things that we're up to. So please subscribe today.